Hello. My name is Theodore Robert Bieber, also known as Ted, the son of George Matthew Bieber. Two weeks ago today, my father passed on. We are here today to celebrate his life of the life of my father. His wishes for such a service were few. One of his wishes was that his service not be a canned service with someone that did not know him speaking of him. Nancy, Anne, Susan, and Julie who asked me to be the master of ceremonies for this service. We feel that this is what he wanted. We believe that another of my father's wishes was that a particular prayer be spoken. This is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Dad was a spiritual man, not overly religious, and I believe that this prayer truly reflects his core values. This is the copy that hung on the refrigerator of the house for many years. This is the prayer of St. Francis of Assisi. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. And where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much to seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, and it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Amen. Another of my father's wishes was that a slideshow of his life be presented. A few weeks before he passed, he discussed the nature of this presentation with my sister Julie. He had already started the work on this show, and Julie completed it. I wish to thank her for her hard work on this presentation. For I know, in this presentation, it is exactly what Dad wanted. It contains music that he wanted to have played also. Can start a slideshow, please? Bound 
kind friends all gathered round There's something I would say Of what brings us together here Has blessed us all today Love has made a circle that holds us all inside For strangers are as family Loneliness can't hide You must give yourself to love If love is what you're after Open up your hearts to The tears and laughter and Give yourself to love Give yourself to love I've walked these mountains in the rain I've learned to love the wind I've been up before the sunrise To watch the day begin And I always knew I'd find you though I never did know how but like sunshine on a cloudy day stand before me now so give yourself to love if love is what you're after open up your hearts to the tears and laughter and give yourself Love. Give yourself to love. Love is born in fire, it's planted like a seed. Love can't give you everything, but it gives you what you need. Love comes when you are ready Love comes when you're afraid It will be your greatest teacher The best friend you have made So give yourself to love Love is what you're after Open up your hearts to The tears and laughter and yourself to love give yourself to love give yourself to when you're smiling when you're smiling the whole world smiles with you when you're laughing when you're laughing the sun comes shining through but when you're crying you bring on the rain so stop your sighing be happy again keep on smiling Cause when you're smiling, the whole world smiles with you. Again, thank you, Julie, for putting that together. I'm sure it's exactly what he wanted. Beautiful thing. My sister Susan. I'd like to speak with my father, Susan. Uh, following that up, all that emotion, uh, I've been struck today with the thought that um, to many of you, I probably don't look like I'm shedding a whole lot of tears. <laughs> Maybe I should be in a different place, and I'm not. Um, this week, it has very much struck me that my father spoke several times in the last year about feeling like he'd been through the trials of Job. And 
as I contemplated that in the last couple of weeks, a book to the Bible. And what immediately follows the book of Job is the book of Psalms, which in my mind is a book of celebration and a book of joy and a book of praise. And that is the direction I'm at right now. And I know that my father would want me to celebrate his life and remember with joy. And so I'm sure I'll cry. And I know I've cried a lot of tears over the last year. But don't misinterpret my joy, his lack of love, respect, or mourning. My dad, the theater arts major, the storyteller, the fisherman, a man full of joy, love, humor, laughter. I'm going to try to do him justice that he deserves the, the presentation man. I'll stand up here and try to do the best I can. I do want to take a moment of silence for us to reflect on my father. And I will follow this up with a brief, brief prayer. Lord, thank you for gathering that we can celebrate my father, celebrate the joyous man he was, and the love that he shared with us all. Help us to, in our morning, find celebration and find peace in knowing that better things are for him now. Lord, we will all miss him. And I just pray that all the words that we share amongst ourselves today be joy, words of love and joy, hope, compassion, and tenderness. Be with us through this. Amen. Um, my dad's born August 36, August 6, 1936, in Webster City, and uh, Marie and Wayne Baby. He was the youngest of three kids. Uh, Jane, his older sister, Jim, his older brother, and they would na nickname him Pumpkin. I asked my aunt this week about that. She said it was for his roundness. She said, I always heard it as punky or punk. I had no idea it was pumpkin as the ground was. <coughs> Even in those days, he was a positive person, a person who knew how to love life and love people. He grew up in Iowa, working as a teenager in his father's auto parts store and the team manager of the wrestling team. He loved the outdoors, camping, hunting, and fishing. He graduated from high school and attended Iowa State for a year. And then in 1956, his parents decided to move out to the Northwest, out to Portland. And he moved on to Lewis and Clark. And he would graduate there with a degree in theater arts. And then move on to the National Guard and the Air Force. And was very thankful not to see any wartime. By 1961, he was working at Coin TV, And he and my mother, Judy, were blessed by the birth of my brother, Ted, who he adored. And then followed up by two gorgeous daughters, <laughs> <laughs> my sister Anne and me. In the late 60s, he would move on to KGW, and he had spent 25 years there enjoying a career of creativity, producing news programs, commercials, PSAs, and his most loved, the Children's Miracle Network Telephone. Finally, he'd end his career there with Lemire's Outdoors. Shortly after leaving KGW, he married Nancy Hoffman, and they enjoyed nearly 22 years of marriage. During these years, they shared so much. They shared a love that is extended throughout all of their family and friends. My, sis my stepsister Julie would later say, it wasn't coincidental that she met Chuck and truly fell in love for the first time after her mother married my father. They had set the example, the example of love. They have had so many blessings and trials. They enjoyed years of hiking, cross-country skiing, and traveling. They traveled the world by train, plane, boat, RV, and automobile. They saw and they enjoyed the world. I heard Nancy say very recently that Dad had taught her to truly love, pardon me, to truly live. 
And I don't doubt that. He had an exuberance and a love for life, and he appreciated so many things. A meal, a song, a painting, a poem, and always a sunset. My sister and I reminisced the other day that it wasn't unusual to hear Dad call us or say to us in a conversation, you wouldn't believe what I just saw, or what I learned, or what I heard. It was so neat. It was so cool. It was so, he was just constantly happy to share a new discovery. And the world just excited him. In the early years of retirement, Dad filled his time with many part-time endeavors. He ranged from census taking to working with volunteers in action, and then playground movie at our elementary alma mater, View Acres. He would become known as Grandpa George. <laughs> and he stayed active while both he and Nancy devoted themselves to helping in the formative years of all their grandchildren, some of which lived under their roof. He was a loving father to Ted and Anne and me. His fatherly love would extend to so many people. I remember through my young years his loving and patient and wise counsel to us, as well as to our friends, always advising us to continue our education, seek our heart's desire, and follow our passions. Dad set me out on my own, knowing his pride and love for me. And Dad was not shy about sharing his pride for all of his children, grandchildren, and even just other long, young lives that he saw mature. He would go boast about the great mother my sister Anne was and is, and what great kids she had, Kelsey and her beautiful singing, Mitch and what a card he was. Dad could appreciate his humor and energy. He saw Julie through her college, through the completion of college, and celebrated her continual successes and advancements in her career as if he were his his own from the very, very beginning. He loved and supported Kate as a father. And he boasted how smart and funny Marissa and Charles were. I don't know how many times I've heard about my friend, my brother's friend, my friend, Bill Billy and his achievements with auto mechanics and how proud he was of him for making the extra effort needed to graduate. And finally, the pride that brings tears to my eyes because I'm so proud as well and so happy that it happened in my dad's lifetime. The repetitive reports of Ted's fantastic grades, his graduation from college, and then his newly granted position as mathematics professor at Clackamas Community College. My father was so proud of all of us, and he wasn't afraid to make that known. The quote that was on his wall for many years in the office, it truly spoke of his heart, and I, I didn't wonder why it was there for so long. It reads like this. A hundred years from now, it will not matter the sort of house I lived in, what my bank account looked like, or what kind of car I drove, but the world may be different because I was important in the life of a child. I haven't been able to spend much time with the other grandkids, Ellie, Josie, Jeremy, Joey, and Leah. But my father was sure that I knew them. I would hear tales of their latest accomplishments and antics. And I heard both the pride and joy and all they brought to him. I knew he knew them all well. And in true George form, he appreciated them for their unique attributes. He loved people. My dad filled my growing up years with joy. His sparkling blue eyes and smile were a true window to his soul. We were best of friends. We laughed and we joked and we played. We camped, we fished. He taught me to tie a perfect fishing knot and taught me to have the patience to untangle that unintended knot. <laughs> he taught me how to bait a hook with a dragonfly nymph so it would stay on there and not to worry too much because I was going to get poked by those pincers. He also taught me how to roll the log in the muck so I could find that dragonfly nymph 
and later I would shock my husband and my stepsons with my skills. <laughs> and by the way, they do work better if you sell them in orange Kool-Aid first. <laughs> <laughs> my dad loved to tell a story, and he did it very, very well. Even as a child, we would love to, him to read from Winnie the Pooh or Tom Sawyer as the characters came to life with his reading. And I'm my father's daughter, but not the storyteller he was. But today would not be complete without the telling of at least one fish story. <laughs> so, tell him down will. You might have already heard it, and I apologize for that, but we'll go up again. This is the day I nearly caught a northern pike. Dad and I had traveled to Mississippi, pardon me, we traveled to Iowa for its class reunion, and it was a trip filled with many memories. One of our final days in Lansing, Iowa, we went fishing on the Great Mississippi. Our guides, Mary Kay Wink and Butch Winky, Dad's cousins, we laughed and we joked. I caught one of my worst sunbirds ever, thank goodness for aloe vera. <laughs> we caught many tiny, tiny sunfish, and they were such a pain. They had me unhooked tossed out, rebait, recast. As a teenager, didn't have a whole lot of patience. I grew tired. I had read the fishing rules and regulations for the Mississippi River, and you can use live bait, or at least then you could. So I took that sunfish and I cast it almost all the way across the Mississippi. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple months later, I felt a tug. I started reeling. I started hollering, get the net! <laughs> I'm reeling, and he said, stop it, Susan. Stop! Start, Susan, quit it. You've got that stupid sunfish. Get that sunfish off your line and fish. Dad, I've got a fish, i got a big one. <laughs> no, you don't. You quit screwing around, sit down. And he sat down, shook his head, looked over the side of the boat, Great big Norman, probably this big. <laughs> <laughs> Alongside the boat. He scrambled. He scrambled. Oh, there is one. Oh, he scrambled. He got the net. Too little, too late. And there we watched that fish open its mouth. Sunfish came floating out <laughs> on the line. And he swam away. Oh, it's going on. So, 30 years later. Story is much more valuable than a fish ever would have been. <laughs> Never have caught a northern pike. But 30 years of laughter, 30 years of apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Over the years, my dad and I played cribbage. And I don't mean we just played cards occasionally. We played cribbage. Dad played with his mom, his kids, his grandkids, his wife Nancy, played in clubs, tournaments. Started a club recently, well, a couple years ago, at the local senior center. And I played with cribbage with my dad as early as I could count. I knew how to count 15 more better than I knew how to count seven. <laughs> we played over campfires. We played on airplanes. We played over teenage heartbreaks and celebrations. We played through both of our divorces and the death of my grandma. <coughs> he played three-way cribbage with grandma and Nancy and two-way with Nancy, and kept an ongoing tally in the logbook. And in February, when Dad fell ill again and was back in the hospital, the only thing that did make sense was to go find that cribbage board, go find some cards, and play. And my brother and I would share our final game of cribbage with Dad in March. And just as he never let us win, we didn't let him win. <laughs> but he won. The father I remember is a man of patience, love, wisdom. He could take my chaos and slow it down, help me sort it out, create calm and organization. And as so many young adults learn, I learned over the years that I had much to learn and gain from him. And so many times, even up through this summer, I knew I could pick up the phone with the weight of the world on my heart, no possible solutions within sight or in grasp, 
but somehow, some way, we can sort it out. This is a part of what I will miss in the years to come. The wise counsel of a man filled with love. There's so much to be said and so much to be cherished, and I, although profoundly thankful to have him out of his pain, will sorely miss his corny jokes, will sorely miss his calm patience, his kindness, and his fatherly love and advice. Thank you. Dad's sister, Jane Devon, a.k.a. Aunt Jane, can't be with us today, but she sent a letter that she wished to be read. It's from Aunt Jane in Fresno. It goes like this. Dear Susan, I hope this is okay for the memorial service. I found it difficult to write without sniffling with love, Aunt Jane. My brother George and I shared so much in our life walk together. We laughed a lot, we cried together, we made decisions together. I will celebrate daily his presence in my life. I am so grateful to Nancy for planning this trip to Fresno about a month ago. It created time for us to be together for a few days. George and I were able to explore again some of our family history, laugh together, and to say goodbye until we meet again on the next journey in eternity. My brother George knew about and practiced love without strings attached, forgiveness, flexibility, appreciation of everything to the max, joy, friendships, and the importance of family, optimism, strength and adversity in the exploring of new things. I will miss my brother George very much until we meet again. And J.D. was heck with y'all, still knows, yes sir. I'm going to call on a couple people to share. We'll conclude with some music. Now we have Will. Will you come and speak, please? Hello, my name is Will. And I don't know George's whole story because I've only known him for four years and I didn't even know he had hair. <laughs> <laughs> but the pictures proved that he did. So I have to go with that. Um, I, I'm going to have George help me get through this because I, I kind of said to myself what I wanted to say 50 times and uh, you know, I still won't get it right. So George, help me. Um, we met about four years ago and uh, took the opportunity just to decide we were going to get to know each other better. And so we, we started uh, having coffee on a weekly basis and sharing our life story with each other. And uh, to, to me, it, everything that everyone said is so true. I mean, uh, he, was, he was comforting. Uh, I, I, I shared my story with him. He shared his story with me. Uh, we got to know each other. We got to talk about our uh, our triumphs and you know the, our triumphs and tragedies. Uh, we just kind of shared our life together, and uh, it was uh, it was a blessing for me to get to know George. And he uh, he was a loving person, and I will I will always always have fond memories of George because of uh, we had a really special relationship. And um, George is okay. And, and I know that because uh, once, w when he was diagnosed with cancer, I, I felt like he reconnected more strongly with his higher power and he, he surrendered his fate and became comfortable. And so he, uh, he fought the good fight, he, uh, he did his physical therapy, he did what he was supposed to do, but he was going to be okay with the outcome, whatever, and, and he is okay. And, uh, and oftentimes, when the family needs to know that, he, 
uh, he, he told me several times how much he loved Nancy and loved both of your families and, and was proud of uh, what people had done. And, um, so it, it was a blessing for me to know George and I, I'm not going to say goodbye. I'm uh, going to tell him I'm going to remember him and I intend to see him again someday. So thank you, George. Thank you, Will. This will be an opportunity for anyone else who would like to speak. I'm going to open it up for anyone else who would like to speak. Raise your hand. Come on up if you'd like. Please. Susan Bass and I worked at Channel 8 with George and first off it's not the Dorn Becker telethon, it's the Dorn Bieber telethon. <laughs> and all my co-workers know that that's true. Um, I'm just going to make this brief. Um, I started working there in 79 and um, I was floor directing and all of a sudden it was um, suggested that I should learn to direct and George was the one that was going to teach me. And um, he was very good and very, very patient with me. Although I don't really know that I was very good, but he seemed to think so. And so I keep this, um, he gave me this, and I keep it on my desk at work. And it says, um, there is a time for laughing and a time for not laughing. This is not one of them. Inspector Clouseau. <laughs> Susan, I don't have my glasses though. Susan, this is it. You're on your own. You're probably just a little nervous. I remember my first solo. Don't worry, I know you'll be fine, and you're an excellent director. Good luck, George. P.S. Clouseau was right, so this must be a time to celebrate. Enjoy. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Did anyone else like to speak? Please. Good afternoon. Oh, you're right, there's a full house. Isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, my name is John Elizalde, and I've known George for a few years, not all that long, but uh, this week um, I've been thinking about George. I, I don't know, maybe some of you have too. Um, and two things struck me. First of all, um, just because of the nature of the relationship I had with him, or, or we had, he could be um, <clears throat> thoughtful and open and honest at levels that were, um, and personal, personally honest and personally open, at levels that were remarkable to me. I mean, he could share what was really going on in his life at any given moment. And he did so in a way that was, um, it, it was inspirational. You know, um, I, I said sometimes cover up stuff so that I don't even know what's going on. And I sure as heck aren't telling you. <laughs> um, but George was the kind of guy who threw his his willingness to be a human being and to just talk about what was happening with his life. And if you think back over the last few years, there's quite a bit going on in his life. Um, and that was a wonderfully inspirational aspect of, uh, of your dad and your father-in-law and your grandpa and, you know, and my friend. And the other thing that really got me, you know, you, you guys had these fabulous photographs of, um, of George's smile. What got me was the twinkle in his eye. <laughs> you know, there are some people who have a sense of humor and a love of life that just pops. You know, and so you'd be listening and there'd be that wry sense of humor. And when you looked, boy, he got you. <laughs> 
you know? And that's fabulous. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak? Hi, I'm Casey Cowan, and I also worked with George at KGW back in the, what we call the good old days, the 80s, yeah. back when news was a lot more fun. <laughs> and I also worked on some of those telethons. Usually I was a field reporter up at the hospital interviewing somebody, and it was just always good to have him in my ear. But I wanted to share a story that maybe a lot of people don't even know, because when I think of George, for some reason, the story always pops into my head. NBC News decided to send Paul Brokaw out and uh, broadcast the show, the nightly news, from places along the West Coast, Portland being one of them since we were their star affiliate. <laughs> and so George had the honor and the challenge of lighting Tom Brokaw. Now, they wanted to have Tom in a place where they could have a beautiful <coughs> city behind him. And I'm not really sure if I remember correctly, but I think it was, they finally found a place in the Big Pink in uh, downtown, looking back towards downtown. So there's Tom with the city behind him and glass. And you gotta light that so that you don't see the glare and that you also see Tom. And George had that challenge and he did it brilliantly. And um, I remember who told me this, I don't think it was George, probably somebody else heard it and shared this, that Tom Brokaw said he has never been lit so well. <laughs> <laughs> now that is something that you can resonate with. Sure. <laughs> I remember him as being such an enthusiastic up person all the time. He's the kind of person when you pass him in the hallway, you might be having a crap day. But George gives you one of his smiles, and you get to keep that, and your day gets a little bit better. And I'll miss it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else would like to speak? Uh, my name is Willie Tune, and I'm another KGW guy. Uh, you know, when you guys talk about smiles, he would come up into the booth as a director, and I don't know how crazy you know that the news is. Last minute, nothing's working right, and all that stuff. He'd walk up into the booth, turn and look at you, and you're, you're the one that was going to be working with him, and he'd smile and say, okay, let's just do this. And you just went, okay, cool, he's got it in control, we can do this thing. And he always had that smile. That's one thing I remember. And then the pumpkin thing, <laughs> the clock, I'm sorry, I was thinking about that on the way over. How round, you know, is it? But it's, it's a great smile. <laughs> and then the, the video of the, of the uh, uh, Dorn Becker. Dorn Beaver. Yeah, <laughs> Dorn Beaver. <laughs> sorry, Susan. <laughs> He was a pioneer with that. I mean, that, none of that had ever been done before. And he was the one that was doing that. And I remember that weekend, because most of us had to stay there for 20 hours working, you know, all these shifts, and you'd see some of the little vignettes he had put together uh, over and over again. And one of them was called Tiny Babies. And it was nothing but music and all of these very small babies, you know, just struggling. And you could have seen that thing 20 times and still the 20th time, you're just, you, you got a tear in your eye. I mean, it was just something. He knew how to put stuff together like that, that could get the best out of what was going on. I had a great time with him. We used to do football shows, uh, preview the high school football shows. Doug Vernon, myself, Steve uh, Scotland, we would go with him and he knew exactly what he wanted to do, but when it didn't work that way, he, he got on his feet and said, yeah, okay, we'll just do it this way. I mean, he was amazing at how he could adjust and change as the times went on. We worked real hard, and we had a good time because one of the things I remember was we went golfing at a place, I think it was in Hermiston. We were out at um, 
Legrand and Pendleton in that area. And it was Hermiston, we were playing on a, on a river. And he asked the guy in the clubhouse, he said, we've never played here before, What's, what should we know about? I guess nothing, no, let's go ahead. Well, we got about four holes out, and I, we got inundated with more mosquitoes than I've ever seen, or ever, have, have ever seen. And George wasn't happy, you know, but that, we kept playing, and we got back in, and he pretty much told the guy, you know, that wasn't cool that you let us go out there without any, you know, safety, because there were, there were mosquitoes all over the place. But I think I have been very blessed and very honored to have worked with him for the years that, he, that I was able to work with him. Um, at KGW, and I'll always remember him very fondly. And um, we had a, a, a nickname for him, Beebs. So, go Beebs. <laughs> we have time for one more person to share. Anyone else would like to share? Kramer and um, I also met George in the past uh, few years and I didn't know him uh, that well but it has been a joy to, to get to know him better and um, I was just so moved at a couple of years ago at a gathering he happened to mention a line of poetry and um, I was really taken by the line of poetry and I mentioned it to him and he said that he would be sure to bring me the poem and sure enough, um, a week or two later, he did. And I was just so touched that he, he remembered to do that. And um, I'm getting a sense he very much appreciated poetry. And I just wanted to read the last part of this poem. Um, I will say that I don't know who it's by. Um, if anyone does, I would appreciate knowing, or I'll look it up later on. I just came across this um, that he had given me just about two weeks ago, just before he died. And so I um, just feel moved to share it with all of you. Oh, I got a zoo. I got a menagerie inside my ribs. So this is just the last part, sorry. Um, oh, I got a zoo. I got a menagerie inside my ribs, under my bony head, under my red valve heart, and I got something else. It is a man-child heart, a woman-child heart. It is a father and mother and lover. It came from God knows where. It is going to God knows where, for I am the keeper of the zoo. I say yes and no. I sing and kill and work. I am a pal of the world. I came from the wilderness. And I um, have so come to appreciate that sparkle in George's eye and that tremendous love that he could share so easily. Thank you. One of the other wishes my father had of this service was that a particular song be played. This song is called The Parting Glass. I believe it comes from the Irish in the late 1700s. He originally heard it performed by the Rite of Spring in the late 1970s. So we believe that there's probably no one more qualified to present this song than the Rite of Springs themselves. Terry, Lynn, Michael, will you please? Should rise and you should. 
should not. I'll gently rise and softly call. Good night and joy be with you all. Good night and joy be with you all. Thank you very much for attending this service. We now ask that we assemble in the other room for more casual celebration of my father's life. Thank you.